Hey, this is Henry Sanders back with another episode of Real Talk. We want to thank our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for everything that you're doing. Thank you for Facebook Journalism Project. Thank you for supporting us through this time. So, hey, look, Mattis. Hey, look, we have uh, we have someone who's important here today, and I'm excited to have this conversation. I've been looking for this conversation all week. Uh, as you know, Madison has some of the highest disparities and achievement gaps uh, in the country. We have lots of challenges, and as you also know is that we've been trying to find a superintendent to come in here and to deal with all of our all the wonderful potential we have. We have lots of potential and all of the challenges that we have. And so we've gone through a second process in the past couple of months and we they decided to hire uh, this brother uh, who is who is well known, who's had some history in Madison, uh, who who's from who knows been in Beloit and all my Beloit people speak very very highly of him. Uh, shout out to Beloit. I love y'all in Beloit. Uh, and so this guy, I'm, I'm excited to have him uh, here. Excited to have him in Madison. Dr. Jenkins, how are you, sir? Hey, I'm doing well, very well. And I'd like to thank you for having me here today on your show. Well, thanks. Hey, thanks. For, so you're here in the, you're back in the Mad City, back in Madison. How's it feel to be back? Uh, I want to say home. How's it feel to be back home? Uh, it's fabulous. Uh, the welcome. Uh, the number of welcomes I've received from cross section of the community has just been awesome. And it's just like it was meant to be to come back, you know, since I was here in uh, 93. It's just amazing. And I think uh, Mr. Heineman said it best. A lot of things have changed and then there are some things appearing to have remained the same. But nevertheless, I'm excited about this opportunity that we have uh, to do great things for our children, our staff, and our community. Yeah, and we're glad. I'm, I'm curious because I was reading some interviews from you, and how did you make the decision to decide that you actually wanted to even apply to come back to Madison, knowing the disparities that we have, knowing that all the stuff is going with the protests? Like, you came in of COVID-19. You came at a really interesting point, and you had to decide to apply for this job. So, what made you even decide that you wanted to come back to Madison to do this job? I, that's a great question. Uh, honestly, if this would have happened probably prior to COVID-19, I probably wouldn't have applied. Uh, it was during COVID-19. I was in Robbinsdale School District doing well, enjoying myself, thinking I was going to finish my career out there, having a wonderful time. Uh, the situation came up with Madison. Uh, with the first time with the first interviews, and I'm saying, okay, Madison will find someone. You know, it's Madison. Madison will find someone easily. And Madison, in my estimation at that time, they didn't have the serious issues from looking from afar because I knew that Madison had resources and Madison have smart people. I know that they could get it done. And well, the first situation happened with the interview, uh, didn't go through, and then they opened up again, and I still was uh, concentrating in Robbinsdale and uh, people were calling me and I was at that point not as interested because I thought the challenges weren't large enough. I figured Madison had it, right? And then I received a call from Dr. Uh, Jolando Jackson. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Whom I have much respect for. He served as my dissertation advisor and he asked me to look at it. And I looked at it and once I look, started looking at the data, I said, whoa. There are some serious challenges and gaps. And uh, as I was analyzing the data, he just simply said to me, he said, Doc, it's time for you to come home. Yeah. Now you've been out there doing all of this work everywhere else. And I have sought out throughout my career, been very blessed to seek out places that had challenges and been able to go in and work with the communities and do some positive things, get positive outcomes, working with the people. And when he said it's time, it's time for you to come back home, come back to your community. And the more I looked at the data, the more inspired I became because it's serious. Some of the largest gaps, disparities in the country. And I'm saying in Madison, this is the work that I've been going everywhere doing and been enjoying doing the work. But now in Madison and uh, actually, honestly, my wife and I, we, we just prayed over it. Next thing you know, I woke up one morning and I turned to my wife and I said, yes, I'm, I'm totally in and feeling it. And the more I got into the data, the more I talked to other individuals and talked back to Dr. Jack, Dr. Jackson and said, yes, sir, I will. 
And uh, I applied for it, knowing that it would be a long shot, uh, because it's Madison. Madison is going to recruit those caliber individuals with the credentials to do the job. And so as we went through the process, I became even more inspired. And the first interview I came to, it was like, oh, my goodness, you know, just coming to Madison. It was in person and just um, just, you know, going back to Madison Memorial, getting the goosebumps of being back in Madison, talking to the people. I became fired up. And then at that point, I had a laser like focus on what I know can happen in terms of changing the narrative around these disparities, because we have the resources. We have a lot of smart people. We have um, a lot of excellent, not only community people, but staff and children. And so I became inspired. That's how I really wind up back here. And I felt like my steps were being ordered. From that point on, it wasn't a matter of thinking a whole lot about it. It was like my steps were being ordered back to Madison. Let's, let's get this done. What I love about what you said is clearly you have a lot of respect for Madison and high standards for Madison. Um, just listen to what you were saying. Like, and this happened in Madison and going through the process, like you were saying that, you you know, this might be a, a real process because it's Madison, Madison, high standards. So that's, that's good. That means you have expectations for the city. And that means if you have expectations that you want to accomplish some things. So that's good to hear. Uh, when you're looking through the data, what... What stood out the most to you that was the most alarming? Oh, the black and brown children in the city of Madison are performing lower than the children in the state that I was born in and raised in, Alabama. And I said, how could this be? No way. When you're talking about black and brown children in the city of Madison with all of these resources, with the greatest public institution in the country, Right here, UW-Madison, all the signs that Ron Edmonds talked about in 1972 with the resources. Madison had one of the fastest growing, one of the best economies in the country prior to COVID-19. I became, frankly, somewhat uh, just really, the only way I could say it, I became really upset saying, no, how could this be? in Madison of all places. And then I became inspired. I became upset, then I became inspired. Then all of this happened on the back of the lynching of Mr. Floyd, which is 16 miles from my home. So as I started thinking about the movement, I said, what would be my part in the movement? And that was kind of the challenge almost that Dr. Jackson put to me. And it all just started to align and I said, hey, uh, this can't be. When I noticed the ELL children performance, um, I became concerned as an educator, knowing that I'm somewhere doing positive work in other places. I began to think if here, then it can happen in Madison. But in Madison, it should happen because we've been leaders in the Madison community, not only locally, state, nationally, internationally, Madison has led the way. So why can't we align the university, our community, all of our resources, and give the children and the families of Madison, this community, what it truly deserves? And so after just wrestling with that, it's, it's, it's on me to say, hey, I wanna be in the movement, not outside looking and wishing and hoping that I would have done something about it. So that's kind of the culmination. That piece of data alone just stood out to me. And I said, I'm here to do something about it for all of our children and take it, uh, work with the staff to move us to another level, work with the community. This isn't something I can do by myself. This is something that I just believe is the right time, the right place to be in Madison to do it. Yeah, and it's an interesting time, right? So with COVID-19 hitting, as you said, Mr. Floyd being murdered, uh, that you know, people are definitely a want change. And with all the things going on in our schools and school district historically, uh, our, our, ch our children have not done well in our schools. I think the expectations are going to be more intense, right? There's going to be more of a sense of urgency. So are you prepared for school to open back up? I like, you know, all that COVID-19, George Floyd getting murdered, all that energy is going to be coming in. People want to change. At the same time, we have COVID-19 in schools. So as you, if, I, if I'm correct, Madison is not open in person, it's going to be virtually, right? Correct. 
Yeah, and, and I'm glad, yes, and I'm glad you brought that up both. First of all, the COVID-19, the virus that we still haven't gotten a handle on, right, around the world. Uh, there are some things that can too impact it, but that brings on one level of stress. The second pandemic is historical. The civic unrest that we're seeing right now around race, and let me be clear, when I came here in 93, I came into Madison under racial politics. I was an assistant principal assigned to Madison Memorial. And if you go back and look at the historical documents, I was listed as an intern the first semester so that the people, primarily white people, could get used to me. And then my title was changed to assistant principal. I never let that taste out of my mouth. And in my career over 30 years, I have said, I will never allow that to happen under my watch for individuals to have that type of an experience. Um, so anyway, coming back to Madison, realizing with COVID-19, realizing with the civic unrest, for as much as, as some things has challenged me in one way, they've also inspired me in the others. Because I believe if not Madison, then where can it happen? How many cities can you go in and they have the resources we have, they have the amount of intellect we have and the serious commitment from individuals to make a difference? So I, I think this is pretty big. This is a big moment at a big time. And I think we're all in the right place. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this challenge, but I do come not being someone new to the game. I know that this is gonna be a challenge. I know Madison. And uh, I know that there will be some uh, who are extremely supportive. But let's, let's just be honest, as you say, real talk, there will be some that it benefits for not all of our children to be as successful. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to bringing them to the table and to show them how it's in their best interest for all of our children to be successful. And um, that's, that's just kind of where I am with this whole situation. I, I, I would not have come if I did not believe that it's possible. Yeah. You know, one of the things about Madison is changing is Madison's growing, but the suburbs are growing more. Some Prairie, Fitchburg, like they're growing. Some Prairie's like one of the fastest growing suburbs in the state of Wisconsin, right? And we have percentage, we have more black people in some Prairie percentage wise than we do in Madison. And I'm saying that because the school district is so important to Madison is that once Madison School District goes down, everything else goes down, right? The school district is why people aren't being here because it's safe, education, say, I mean, all the Keith core things, the Madison School District is so important. But we're also seeing, you know, for lack of a better word, white flight, meaning people are leaving Madison, it's time to go out to the suburbs, et cetera. So what do you do as a superintendent coming in, recognizing that you have a population that's clearly uh, not doing well and is not meeting the goals that they should for lots of systematic reasons of our black and brown babies. And then there's also the, the, the white folks who are starting to leave Madison, move to Mount Horeb and move to Wanakee and move different places. How do you deal with both, both those issues at one time as a superintendent? One, I think we have to take back control of the real narrative. The narrative that we have with these disparities happen with our children, uh, primarily black and brown versus their white peers. I think that target we have to recalibrate because if you really look at the data across the country and when we start looking at it internationally, our white students are not competing internationally like they used to compete. Um, when we look at the data of the black and brown children and we're setting the bar to achieve as their white peers are, that bar may be too low. And we need to look at the gap between excellence and non-excellence. Hmm. And if we shoot for the organization to become one of excellence where we can compete again internationally, um, that's where the bar, the bar itself drives individuals who are looking for excellence. So if individual white flight occurs, they come home when they see the excellence. And that's what we got to push for, excellence for all. But we also in the immediate have to disrupt these low expectations 
or these racist barriers, these practices that has persisted since integration, before integration, with the design of the Constitution and how we value individuals, that all play into creating excellent environments. And I've, I've been a part of, and there's evidence out there to suggest individuals sitting next to one another based upon their pigmentation doesn't necessarily lead to great outcomes. Hmm. But the high expectation for all will, regardless of the pigmentation. There are other benefits. Now, let me tell you, uh, Russell C. Uh, Rucker Johnson, in his book, The Children of the Dream, has clearly outlined some benefits for us moving forward. And I do believe we should move forward in an integrated approach. But I don't think that we should set our expectations for certain children based on their zip code or based upon the pigmentation of their skin. I, I don't think then we're setting anyone up for real success. We should set the bar and then remove the barriers. There are a lot of systemic barriers right now that's causing these uh, gaps. We have the resources in Madison. We have the people in Madison. We have all the science on the hill that everyone around the country, around the world is coming to get. When we take these and take the collaborative approach, we can disrupt what is currently happening. So that's where uh, I think we focus in on the reading, which is clear, and the performance of international student assessment. We're not doing well. America is not doing well. When it comes to math and science, America is not doing well. The narrative has to go to, let's make sure that our teachers are getting the appropriate resources that they need, the appropriate professional development, and start it very early, not saying that learning stopped at grade nine, but we have to support teachers, we have to support principals, we have to support the school system. Public education is and still has been and still remains as the cornerstone for being able to change the life trajectory of individuals. But let me say this, public education and education in general hasn't served all children well, historically. Yeah. This is an opportunity to get it right right now during this particular movement that we have going on with the civic unrest and with the COVID-19. It has brought a sense of human decency. We have to think about one another more now uh, during this pandemic, be very intentional about the outcomes we're expecting. Yeah, I love that you're talking about expectations. And I think that's really key. And we don't talk about it enough, especially in Madison, that there's clearly a low expectation for our kids, for black and brown kids. And I'm glad you hear you talking about that, having a higher expectation, because our kids can achieve. I mean, they're clearly intelligent. They have the talent. You just have to put some goals on them. But so a question for you is that um, me growing up in a master school district, I've been here my whole life. Every I mean, went to Mendota Elementary School, Gompers, the best high school in, in the city, East High School, per Golders all day. Uh, so I grew up into the school district. And I can count on one hand how many black or brown teachers I had growing up through the school system. Maybe three. Uh, Miss Stanford, uh, Juan Lopez, uh, Mr. Scott, Miss McPike, who was a principal at East. Uh, so not a lot of black or brown teachers. What's, you get older, that has an impact on you. So do you think that the school district at some point will have an emphasis on trying to get clearly qualified teachers, but black or brown folks more in the schools to teach and be around our kids, especially, you know, in the data, our schools are more diverse than ever. You look at the diversity, there's more kids of color in our schools than not. Do you, are you going to put an emphasis on that at all? Well, let me say prior to my coming and one, as a part of my research, I noticed that uh, MMSD has been putting a focus on trying to recruit uh, particularly uh, staff of color, African-American, Latinx staff, just staff of color. Recruiting is one thing, retaining is another. Yes. We have to focus on our core values, talk about belonging, feeling, you know, welcome, welcoming, right? And addressing the whole issue around racial and social justice. Children watch how we treat adults. And if we don't treat our staff well, children know that. And I'm talking about in the school system and in the community. 
what things do we have in the community? This is more of a community issue. When you're diversifying as a school district, you're also diversifying the community. What things do we have in our community for individuals once we recruit them here so that they can raise their families in a community and have opportunities that mirror them? They may have a traveling spouse. They may have children that they want to have outside activities. What do we have in a community? That's more than just a school district issue. But the reality of it is every piece of literature, everything you hear from the unions, you hear, um, you just research it and, it and it tells you that children who have that one experience are more likely to graduate and be successful of having someone who look something like them through their educational journey. So yes, we have to focus on that. We have to focus on diversifying, not only at the teacher rank, ranks, but at the administrative ranks, we have to look at our school board, we have to look at all of this and that diversity. And just like in the business world, the companies, they understand their bottom line gets impacted the more they diversify. And we can't have a district with our demographics and continue to regress in terms of the staffing of color that we have. And not just in token roles, but in positions to be able to influence the outcomes. Yeah, that's great. You um, clearly you sound like you you understand the city and the dynamics, which is great. You you I'm listening to you. You're talking about all the little nuances going on in the city, which is true. And data does back it up. More diversity equals more innovation. Helps your bottom line. I mean, this is just factual data stuff that people in Google you can find that out. So, last question before I let you go. How do you what's three years from now, five years from now? How do you know that you've been successful to move the needle? What are, what are some things that you'll be looking at for you professionally as your own personal development, as you, as, a, as, as the superintendent, but also as the district? What are some key things that you're looking for and say, yep, Henry, you know what? I know we're moving in the right direction because we have A, B, C, and D like three to five years from now. Hopefully you're here three to five years from now. So let's say, you know, hopefully you're here longer than that. But just say after three to five years, what do you think some of the metrics would be for a successful for you in the district? Well, for, for myself, when I think about what you're gonna be able to measure, you should be able to look and see that we have some clear expectation for a reading in our district that we have collaborated from all the groups. I'm talking about MTI, our principals association, our parents, everyone understands that we have a clear vision for reading and high reading expectation in our district that we have a system that is, that's wrestling, willing to wrestle with annihilating any kind of thought of racial barriers to our children learning and their safety. That in our system, three years from now, we're seeing that progress being made across the board for all of our children and that this conversation is about what's going to be the next steps because we would have already seen in some cases incremental um, deconstruction of barriers that we know that are counterproductive and that we're seeing quantifiable results in three years we should see us moving in that direction. And this conversation in our community, um, I believe is important for us to talk about the whole community in terms of the safety of our children, that they're in an environment in schools where they're safe, that they're participating in a new way of learning, not going back to post COVID to traditional learning where certain children are succeeding, but we have increased the level of our delivery of instruction, how we're measuring that, and how we engage in our community differently. If we engage in our community, real community, everyone from the single parent to the top CEO should be comfortable. Hey, my child is getting a quality education. In three years, that's where we are uh, as a district. And we've been fighting the good fight. I think that we have to realize it's not negative to say we're going to wrestle with something. We're going to put it on Front Street. A three-year timeline, 
I think we should come back and say, okay, where are we? Where are we trying to go? And I think in three years, if we do that, I think uh, in my estimation, in my experience in doing this work, we can get this done. But if the community doesn't stand up and get involved, have a voice in it and support it, we have this referendum coming right now. This is critical during these unprecedented times to not have the right level of support, not to continue to have our schools be competitive locally, state, nationally, internationally, not only with facilities, but with the operations. This is pretty serious. This referendum should start a conversation that this community is talking about the future and not just right now. Okay, that's what I say. Well, we thank you for coming. It's a, you know, it's a, again, it's lots of challenges. However, there's lots of potential opportunity. And I totally agree with what you said about if Mattis can't get this right, I don't know why, who can get it right because we're, we're big enough and but at the same time we're small enough and have the resources enough that we're connected enough that we, we have all the things we need. We have people who care, who want to give back financially. We have the intellectual uh, property here that people like. We have a lot of people who understand this stuff and want to dig in. And our community really care. I mean, we care about our community. So I'm just hoping that we all are supportive and can keep fighting the fight with you. And uh, we're excited that you're here. We're excited that you took the challenge. Uh, we're excited that you have a clearly you have a standard of excellence that you're talking about. Uh, and we just want you to be successful. So thank you for coming. Oh, and thank your wife. Thank your wife. Thank your wife. <laughs> God bless her. I want. I can't wait to meet her. I can just, right. give her just give her a big hug. Like thank you. Just thank you. Just thank you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because that's not easy. Just getting up, moving. Oh. Uh, and, and especially when you know your significant other moves with you, something like that. She's in this job with you, like it or not, too, right? So, uh, right. what's your wife's name? Lisa. Lisa. Uh, Lisa. Nice to meet you, Lisa. Hopefully, we meet you soon. And welcome, welcome back to. Was she with you back in the nineties? Oh, she was. She's been with me. It seems like my whole life we've been together, man. Uh, and she's definitely. I appreciate you acknowledging her. We were talking about it today. As she's trying to list a house and sell it in Minnesota, she's trying to find a house here. Uh, we have a grandbaby, Bruns. Our daughter Jasmine. When I was here the last time, we had Jasmine was born here in Wisconsin. Oh. So she's back with us too. We're bringing the whole family back together. We're very excited to be back here as a family and look forward to doing some. Very disruptive work here in yeah. uh, Madison. Well, the whole family, whole Jenkins family, we love that y'all are here. We got number Madison 365, got number love for y'all. Anything we can do for you, uh, even the grandbaby. We love you too, grandbaby. Uh, and so, <laughs> bronze welcome to the bronze. bronze, bronze. Okay, bronze. We love you too, bronze. Uh, and <laughs> welcome back to the Madison. You should have never left us, bronze. You should have been here anyways. <laughs> Right, right, right. We're here. We're here. And I appreciate you so much. I really do. I appreciate this interview. And let's just pull this thing off together. And uh, I would definitely look forward to talk to having you have the Chiefs come back, talking about opening of schools. Yeah. That's really big on everyone's mind, how we're going to do it virtually and how we're preparing ourselves as this thing, um, this COVID-19 moves out, what's going to be our next step to do it in a very safe way all of our students, all of our staff, and all of our community. Yeah, and you can't do it alone. And so I'm, I'm no, can't. you can't do it alone. It's a big challenge, but it's doable. And so thank you again, Dr. Jesus, for coming. Thank you. The only thing I hold against you is that you, you you kept saying Memorial's name too much. You should never say that in front of a, you should never say that in front of an East Side Pergola dude. But I'm letting, I'm, I'm letting the slide this time, Dr. Jenkins. But let's not have it happen again. Yeah. <laughs> Milk Mac Pite, I thought he was gone, so I thought I was safe this time. <laughs> no, that's that, that's my mentor. He's with me. We walk with me, so he's, it's never gone. East side all day. East side all day. Seriously, thank you, Dr. Jenkins. We'll see you next time. And seriously, tell your family over there. We'll be praying for you. We want you to be successful. Thank you for taking this challenge. Thank you for loving Mass enough to come back. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time on Real Talk. Thank you. This is 365 Media.